All right. Well, welcome everyone to the satellite session on telehealth innovations for HIV services hosted by the EPIC project, UNAIDS and WHO. My name is Ben Eveslage. I'm the Associate Director Technical for Telehealth at FHI 360. And a little bit about the EPIC project, it's a USAID PEPFAR funded five-year uh, HIV service delivery program, now implementing programs in around 40 countries. So telehealth is near and dear to my heart. I lead a team at FHI 360 that supports HIV and some other health service delivery programs to use virtual uh, channels. Uh, we call it going online. So in 2017, uh, in, in, sorry, in 2017, our team envisioned what it means for HIV programs to use virtual channels, to use them to reach and engage new audiences who we haven't reached before, to support their engagement in HIV services, and to accelerate the impact of HIV programs. So five years later, we were surprised to see that this vision really did become so much of a reality. And I think COVID-19 was really the impetus behind this shift to using virtual platforms. Telehealth is here in at least many countries, and I think it's here to stay and to grow. So I'm honored to moderate this satellite session and to introduce you to our panelists in just a short while. Let's take a sneak peek at what we have today. Other slides? We'll pull up the slides in just a moment. I'll continue. So we have a 90-minute session, and I'll just take a couple more minutes to introduce us to this topic and then move into around 45 minutes of rapid presentations on some of these uh, telehealth innovations from uh, six presenters around the world. And then we have 30 minutes for moderated discussion where you in the, in the room or you online can ask questions and they'll be fielded by our moderator. All right, so what is telehealth? The New England Journal of Medicine has a pretty broad definition, the delivery of health care, health education, and information services via remote technologies. But when we look at the word telehealth, we think first tele, like telephone, and health. And really what it comes down to for many of our programs is mobile phones. That's how most people find information and connect with others remotely, is from their phone. We'll go to the next, well, I'll, I'll use the clicker. <laughs> So our, our panel will explore innovative virtual approaches to reach and engage communities, deliver HIV and related services, and retain clients in HIV care. We'll hear primarily from HIV program staff and implementers themselves who aim to provide real experience and lessons from implementing these innovations. And we look forward to your questions to help us uh, have a great discussion on issues related to equity, security, and other implementation challenges. So why should HIV programs introduce, scale, telehealth innovations and solutions? Our panel will be exploring this in more detail and providing some rationale. But in short, programs can broaden their outreach to previously unreached audiences, including the growing mobile generation, Programs can improve their targeting, not only by reaching those who are underserved and who have not been reached by the existing in-person service delivery, but also by leveraging the targeting available on social media and on virtual platforms to ensure their messages reach their communities of interest. Virtual solutions also enable self-care, uh, which aligns with many people's preference to engage in healthcare more directly and on their own, and also reduces the burden on the health system. And finally, I think we're all familiar with the impact of COVID on HIV service delivery, and virtual channels allow us to engage people remotely and from a distance. So let's take a practical look at what we mean by uh, telehealth innovations for HIV services. Here is the familiar HIV services cascade from identify to reach to testing and linkage into more routine forms of prevention or HIV treatment, retention, and viral suppression for those people living with HIV. This, uh, excuse me, um, here you can see a simplified version of the cascade on the top, the same bars you had before, just 
truncated, just reduced. And below are boxes that represent virtual approaches that allow programs to make achievements on each of these bars of the cascade. So this framework was published as part of a guidance for HIV programs under the Global Fund and also under a forthcoming publication of policy brief with UNAIDS and WHO, which Purvi Shah will be presenting on later. I'd like to also highlight a couple of the other presenters and the topics that they will be presenting on, referencing this figure here. So under the reach bar, you see here the second bar on the left-hand side, there's broad marketing approaches that HIV programs can use to reach their target audience. Social profile outreach is one of those. What it means in simple terms is online advertising. And we have one presenter, Anuradha Sharma from uh, Nepal, who will be presenting on that approach. And right below is social influencer outreach. This is when you have social media influencers that have either a large reach or are very influential and use social media platforms to engage followers. And we have uh, Jamie Arkin from uh, iFluence in Kenya who will be presenting on that. And for clients engaged uh, in routine HIV prevention or treatment services on the right side of this cascade, you can find virtual case management, which allows community and clinical case managers to use virtual tools to organize their cohort of clients on PrEP and ART, triage clients that are in need of additional support, or keep track of the service access among clients in their cohort. Carl Naimwaka from Namibia will be presenting on this topic. Also part of virtual case management are virtual consultations, which have become a very powerful tool to provide consultation-based services remotely for mental health, psychosocial support. And Rhea Lahoud is joining us from Lebanon, and Robin Dayton is here in the room uh, to present on this very topic. I should note that while we have developed this model for using virtual channels, channels for uh, the HIV services cascade, this framework need not only be deployed for HIV. You can see here a roadmap for comprehensive telehealth services, which is more health agnostic. Uh, we're using this uh, to support similar telehealth services for STI programs, mental health programs, COVID-19 programs, and maternal and child health programs. So I hope that I've been able to provide an adequate review of telehealth for HIV. However, if you have more questions, feel free to write them down, remember them, we're gonna have a discussion later. And you can also learn more about this framework. You can quickly access some of these documents here and many more by going to fhi360.org slash going online. So now we're gonna get started with the presentations. I'm very happy to get started with these. We're gonna start with a pre-recorded video from Anuradha Sharma. Uh, she's actually in a plane right now, so thank goodness she's able to pre-record. Those visa issues have been challenging, I think, for many people. Um, she is the Social and Behavior Change Officer for FHI 360 in Nepal, and she's presenting on using Facebook Ad Manager to reach key populations for HIV in Nepal. So we can go ahead and play that video. Thank you, Ben. Um, hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Today I'll be presenting on using Facebook Ad Manager to reach key populations for HIV services in Nepal. Um, this presentation will take you through the ad campaign as outlined by its background, process, results, and lessons learned, including the next step. Talking about the background, we set out with the basic understanding that our key populations globally have moved away from traditional to virtual world and uh, hotspots in recent years. We came to this understanding through an online convenience survey implemented back in 2017 in Nepal among our key populations to learn about their uh, use of social media and preferences for HIV services. Uh, in this survey, we found that 64% of our KPs ref preferred social media for receiving information on HIV and sexual health. Also, 62% of our KPs are actually on Facebook, making Facebook the most preferred social media platform among our KPs. Uh, this also goes in line with the Nepal's uh, National HIV Strategic Plan from the Government of Nepal, which aims to promote use of digital technologies and social media platforms to penetrate deeper networks among young populations for fast-tracking HIV response in Nepal. 
so FHI 360 Nepal participated in Meta 2022 Accelerator Workshop SPCC program. As part of this program, FHI 360 Nepal received Facebook ad credits and support to run a health campaign on Facebook. Um, the goal of this campaign was to support Epic Nepal's offline program on HIV, that is to increase demand generation of pre-exposure prophylaxis, that is PrEP, among men who have sex with men, MSM, and transgender women of ages 18 to 45 who are on Facebook. Uh, we plan to measure the performance of this campaign strictly through brand lift study and bookings for PrEP as registered on Nepal's online reservation application, ORA, uh, which we also know as Merosathi. The first major activity in preparing for the campaign was to define our target audience in Facebook. Uh, from among the 13 million people who are on Facebook all over Nepal, we strategically defined our target audience for this campaign based on age, gender, geography, and interest of our KPs on Facebook. Uh, using filters to define our target audiences, we focused on men and women of ages 18 to 45 from all over Nepal and used interests like gay love, pride, love and sex, blind dating, etc. to refine our target audiences. Uh, with these filters, our target audience on Facebook fell on the range of 1.1 million to 1.3 million. Uh, this way, um, the targeting might seem quite wide, but uh, it was a conscious decision on our part because we needed to have a minimum of 1 million target audiences to run, run a brand, brand lift study. Also, given the nature and specific interests of our KPs as target audiences, our approach in reaching them through Facebook had to be carefully planned. For instance, in order to reach MSM, we would need to carefully select filters through interests that are closely aligned with the target audience. Since few years ago, Facebook removed option to advertise men interested in men directly. Therefore, uh, getting our KPs through Facebook post as the major challenge since Facebook has limited options to how, target, uh, how to target ads on their manager and these change all the time. So uh, with this understanding and precise targeting, we moved on to prepare a detailed campaign plan. Uh, what you see in the screen is the snapshot of our campaign plan. Um, our campaign plan defined the problem as a low uptake of PrEP among KPs. Uh, we took into account the key contextual considerations regarding the knowledge, attitude, perception, and access of KP uh, behaviors. We further refined our target through Facebook filters and interests. Apart from that, we also exercised intensively on persona development and empathy mapping, which further helped us uh, gain insight into the sensibilities, uh, anxieties, uh, key drivers and barriers, and the overall lives of our KPs. For measuring the performance, we defined the communication and SPCC metrics and also budgeted our campaign in such a way that we could reach as many target audiences as we could in the given time. We planned our campaign in, uh, in a way that each month we would have different key messages which, which would progressively guide our target audiences towards the expected behavior change, uh, that is to book for PrEP on Aura in order to prevent HIV. Uh, month one of our campaign focused messaging on the knowledge and attitudinal behaviors, including stigma and fear of disclosure. Uh, the call of action for this month would be to start a chat or to learn more. Uh, for month two, we would then shift our focus to access issues, promoting aura and confidential services, including the affordability of our services. Uh, likewise, for month three, we will then focus on linkage to services and online booking through Mirosati. Uh, at the same time, we would also carefully choose our brand lift questions to align with the key messages of each month's campaign. Right now, we are in the month one of our campaign. So, uh, why brand lift study? Um, we used brand lift study because uh, it is a strategic tool for advertisers which helps measure outcomes of ad campaigns. Uh, it's a kind of a lift test where you can use brand polling and other brand awareness measurements to help understand the true value of uh, advertising and how well it performs independent of your digital communication or other advertising efforts. Uh, it basically, what it does is it divides the audiences into two groups. Uh, one is the control group and the other is the treatment group. Uh, 
Uh, we can then access the performance of our ads depending on how well we were able to reach and get the desired behavior change through these ads of, among each of these groups. Uh, for the first month of our campaign, we chose two brand lift study questions uh, that you can now see in the screen uh, that aligned best with our key messages for the month one campaign that included questions uh, like uh, which concerned with the knowledge and attitude of audiences. So uh, next in the process was the creation of actual ads to post on, as, on Facebook. Uh, what you see on the image is two of our creatives pre prepared for the first month of our campaign. The messaging was kept simple that focused on addressing knowledge and attitude barriers. Uh, hear about the effectiveness of PrEP to prevent HIV. Uh, brand lift questions were also chosen to align with this information. On the bottom right corner of each of the creatives, uh, you can see a call for action. Uh, that is to start a chat for getting necessary information on PrEP and also to increase uh, brand awareness about Nepal's Aura platform, that is uh, Mirosarthi. So with this, our creatives are ready. Now let's quickly go over the Ads Manager page on Facebook and to have a sort of uh, demonstration on how these creatives are actually uploaded on, on Facebook and how the um, campaign is set up. As you can see on your screen, uh, we start with uh, providing a new ad set for the campaign. Here we have uh, two different ads that were prepared. Uh, we defined the budget and schedule of the campaign. Here we had uh, $200 for each day. Uh, this was also planned according to the wide target setting that we had done uh, given the huge audience size that we had. and and uh, so that we could reach our audiences better uh, on a daily scale. Um, for the first month, uh, our dates were selected for from July 15th to August 15th. Uh, and we also uh, defined the target audiences as we had already talked about, uh, given the location, is gender, um, interests, and the languages and everything. So after that, uh, we had created two creatives. Uh, those were uploaded into the system and uh, we also uh, defined the call for action. Uh, for this uh, first month of our campaign, our call for action was the start a chat uh, to learn more about PrEP and uh, learn how PrEP would be beneficial for you. Uh, so that we added on the creatives. We had created uh, two different creatives. One is a still image like you can see on your screen right now and the other one was GIF. So uh, with this we moved ahead with our uh, campaign plan. Now quickly moving on to show how results are obtained and analyzed through ad campaigns with Brandlift study. Uh, our PrEP campaign is ongoing and results are still coming in. Meanwhile, uh, we have data from our last year's campaign on COVID-19 uh, focusing on vaccine hesitancy. Uh, this is just to illustrate on the kind of data and results we get from such ad campaigns. Uh, from this campaign, we still don't have uh, enough data to present, so I will be focusing on data and results from the last year's campaign. Uh, that would provide us a brief overview of what to expect from this campaign. Uh, as we can see, we get exact data on overall performance of each ads, like uh, we get the number of reach, number of impressions, engagement, uh, cost effectiveness, etc. Uh, brand lift study results were another very insightful resource for us. Here we can see the level of details that we can get about our ad performance. Uh, we get to learn how each of these campaigns performed on different platforms, how much money we spent and who we were able to reach and engage through our campaign. Uh, these details were crucial for us to renew, review our campaign performance and also provided us insights to better approach our campaign plans in future. So what we learned from this campaign was that social media campaigns are most effective to reach out to young KPs. It is useful in targeting uh, specific groups of population with tailored messages and expected behavior change goals. Uh, and our next steps would, on this would be to continue the practice of social media advertisement campaigns for demand generation and behavior change among young KPs. 
uh, we will continue promoting aura through such campaigns and we will move to other A's and gender segments to close gaps in our offline programs. Um, also, we will expand our campaign to promote HIV treatment and adherence in next phase of our social media campaign. Uh, lastly, we would also use influencers and peer champions on social media to gather uh, more of an organic audience as well, apart from the paid advertisements. Uh, here are some resources for more information on Nepal's going online activities on online delivery of HIV services to KPs uh, in Nepal. Um, so that's all from me today. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha. Uh, she is landing in, I think, 30 minutes. Very unfortunate. But if you have questions, feel free to ask. We'll try to address it within the panel. And we'll go to the next uh, pre-recorded video for Jamie. I'll be introducing her. She is online, and she will be able to take questions, so feel free to note those down. We'll have, be having Jamie Arkin, who is a managing director for iFluence, based in Nairobi, Kenya. And she's presenting on scaled micro-influencer campaigns for health. Go ahead and play the video. Hi, my name is Jamie Arkin. I'm the managing director of iFluence Reach. iFluence Reach is a division of a company called iFluence based here in Nairobi, Kenya. And what iFluence Reach does is we want to think about how we can utilize marketing and advertising strategies in the social impact and development space. And what I'm here to talk to you today about is how we use peer to peer communication powered by social media in the HIV and health world. So what we're doing at iFluence is trying to solve one key challenge, mass communication, particularly in the digital world. We understand that peer-to-peer -peer communication is one of the most successful drivers of behavior change. So how can we utilize technology to create innovative and interesting strategies that don't replicate traditional media like radio in order to address people across different languages, cultures, ethnic backgrounds, physical borders, and really overcome some of the key challenges we know have held us back in the past. What iFluence does to solve the problem is we look for opinion leaders on social media, which might be different from those offline because these are typically younger people who are more active on their mobile phones than some of the people we've used in the past to lead campaigns like Village Elders. And so what iFluence does is work with these opinion leaders on social media to utilize their platforms and their trusted network of peers to drive relatable and authentic conversations that do the following. There's four key things they're going to do. They're first going to build awareness. How can you tell people about um, HIV? How do you make them aware about uh, their infection rates, et cetera? The second thing they can do is generate demand. As we introduce new products and services like at-home test kits or PrEP, how can they make people interested in receiving those services and products? The third thing is social behavior change, repeatedly expressing and sharing with their communities about best practices and activities they can do for their own betterment. And then the last piece is closing feedback loops. Um, how can they ensure that they're collecting feedback from the community that can then advise better programming decisions? And so in our approach, iFluence starts with a technology and we use AI to find micro and nano influencers, which I'll explain more deeply. And we work with them to create their own content. And this is really important because we want to make sure that they're telling their own stories so that they're interesting and relatable and they're able to share them across all of the social media networks. And so influencers create their own content, which is guided by health experts. And then it's reviewed by the iFluence team before anything goes live to ensure that it aligns with MOH best practices and health standards. And they post it on the leading social media networks. Now, why this is really interesting, our engagement approach starts by who we're working with. And I mentioned what a micro and nano influencer is. And these are people with anywhere from 1,000 to about 25 to 30,000 followers on social media. When I say the word influencer, everybody's minds go to celebrities and those people have great visibility. They've got millions of followers. The challenge is that they're not actually very well engaged with the audience. If you're trying to promote uptake of prep in a highly urban uh, slum or even in a rural area, 
a celebrity talking about prep isn't going to relate to the people who we need to use it. And so rather than trying to create an aspirational vision, we believe that health shouldn't be aspirational, it should be accessible. And by using micro and nano influencers, you're modeling somebody who's similar to our target audience to actually utilize a service or change a behavior. And so while the visibility of an individual micro and nano influencer is smaller, when we use 50 or 100 or 1,000 of them, they actually attain the same visibility as a celebrity while having more engagement, right? If you comment on something your friend posts, they're going to respond and they're more likely to lead to conversion because they're referring to places and services within your own neighborhood. So our technology helps us find the people who become our influencers. As I mentioned, we're looking for people with a specific number of followers, but we also want people who have a campaign affinity. Maybe they've spoken about HIV in the past. Maybe they are of a certain community. Maybe they um, are community health workers. And so they themselves care about the subject. And we want to make sure their friends and family on social media are the people in our target audience. They're the right demographics in the right geographic area. And those are the people that are then our influencers. And it all feeds into what we call the trust ecosystem. We're going to find the right people who can speak about the subject and they're going to be the ones leading the campaign. The second thing that we're looking at is they can share the right messages. It's going to be personalized and authentic. The reason I might prefer to use an at-home test kit is different from the reason you might choose to use an at-home test kit. Let's both share our reasons and it allows both of us to get to the same goal while having a many size fits all approach we're gonna share it in the right way. So it's gonna be linguistically, ethnically, culturally sensitive. The way I tell a story or express myself, it's gonna be different from the rest of everybody else here on the call. And we wanna make sure we allow people to do that. And the last piece is we use our technology and our platform to adapt in real time to the results of the campaign. iFluence has worked across Africa in more than 11 countries and in Thailand and India on more than 15 health campaigns. Now there's three key components to each campaign. The first is of course, as we mentioned, finding the right people using our AI platform. The second is our human effort. We have a team of experts in the marketing sector who create a campaign brief and support the development of a strategy so that each week of a campaign, we're talking about something different to engage the audience. So it doesn't feel like a billboard or a TV ad where you have the same thing playing over and over again, but actually have a conversation that's evolving to the population's needs. And then of course, the last piece is using our platform to monitor and evaluate the outcome of each campaign in real time. And so what does it look like? Well, here's a sample of what content can look like. You can see that there's some GIFs, there's some videos, there's selfies. We actually even had somebody who was uh, utilizing HIV testing services at a private facility go to the facility, show the experience that they were treated respectfully, that the facility was clean, that this is what they were charged as expected. And I want to share one use case with you. And so this was a campaign we ran actually around the introduction of a new family planning product in Cote d'Ivoire and Togo. And over just six weeks, we reached over 900,000 individuals and had interaction, had over 113,000 interactions with that content. That's an engagement rate of 12%, which is significantly above industry standard of 2 to 3%. But what was also really critical in this was our feedback loops and what we learned from the public. What we learned from the public was that they were struggling to understand the branding for the campaign as it was a new product that felt familiar, felt similar to other family planning products on the market. And so we needed to have a stronger strategy for identifying this product. The second thing we learned was really where people wanted to receive the product. They didn't want to get it from a healthcare facility. They wanted to get it from a pharmacy. And the third major learning we understood was that they wanted an expert at the point of sale or at the point of receipt, receipt to explain the product and give them that um, sense of confidence and, and training so that they really understood what they were getting into. And I think a lot of these lessons here from family planning could also be utilized in the HIV space. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to if you have any questions and feel free to reach out to me on my email here. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I hope you're able to hear the applause on the call. Uh, we'll go to our next two presenters who are tag teaming. We have Robin Dayton here. Uh, she's a technical advisor for gender at FHI 360 and we have Raya Lahoud, uh, who is in Lebanon, uh, joining virtually, and she's a consultant for Pragma on the MENA Moves project. 
So let's hand, and they'll be presenting on virtual mental health support for vulnerable populations in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Robin, and we'll pull the PowerPoint for Robin. Thank you, perfect, all right. So, okay, wonderful. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all and talking about something that's so incredibly relevant to all of us as individuals and of course in our HIV programs, which is mental health. And I have the pleasure to be talking about something that we've done in North Africa that's currently being piloted um, as we speak and really sharing some of our initial data with you. Okay, so as a brief background, we work with local partners, civil society organizations across these three countries who are providing HIV services to key populations um, and other vulnerable groups. And this includes a fair number of young LGBTQ plus identifying folks. And there was a real need identified by these implementers for mental health services. And I think that you know, fundamentally makes a lot of sense. We know that people living with HIV are more likely to experience depression and other mental health struggles. We also know that it is more difficult to engage in prevention behaviors and to adhere to treatment when someone is experiencing mental health issues. So with all of that going on, and then of course the stigma, discrimination, violence experienced in these communities, there was a call from these CSOs for greater mental health support for both their implementers and for their clients. And we were able to meet that need through the MENA Moves project supported by USAID and the way that looked was we reached out to these CSOs and said, who are the psychologists that you already trust? How can we engage them in this process? They nominated psychologists who were then brought on to work on this online platform. So everybody nominated had to be willing to use Quick Res, which Rhea will be providing a demonstration of, and then to provide both in-person and virtual services because we did want to address a lot of those barriers to access that we've all been discussing. So in terms of the operations, this was really a small but mighty team. So starting just last September, we only have nine psychologists on the ground, but as you'll see from our data, they have done quite a lot. All of these folks are working part-time. As an initial step, because this was gonna have a telehealth option, we had a local lawyer take a look at all of the policy frameworks across the three countries to make sure both that we were within the policies as they relate to providing mental health services online and also that we could really be protecting our data appropriately with the vulnerable groups we were working with. We then trained psychologists and also CSOs on telehealth and on the online booking platform. So these folks, the psychologists, are already mental health experts. This was really about making sure that they felt comfortable using online booking and that they could do things like suicide prevention in a virtual space that they had already been doing in person. Initially, all of the bookings were made by the CSOs. So they had clients or implementers who they knew to be interested or to whom they offered the services, and then they made those bookings, and the psychologists then made additional bookings based on their clinical knowledge and, of course, client consent and desire to continue. And what's wonderful, throughout this pilot, we've had a very close relationship with these psychologists, hearing from them on what works, what doesn't work, and we've also done some formal surveys of both the psychologists and CSOs to understand and then integrate their inputs. This video is a short demo of how QuickRes was used in the Minamos project. To make a booking, one should go to quickres.org and select the country in which they are located. Clicking on the Start button takes us to the next page where consultation types are listed. For this project, options are limited to in-person, remote, and emergency consultations. We then select the preferred location and local providers are presented. Once the provider is selected, we choose the date and time and add the contact information. Appointments can be booked on another person's behalf, which is where the local CSOs supported us by booking appointments for their beneficiaries who did not have proper access to technology. Once the booking is complete, beneficiaries who choose to receive an SMS confirmation, while providers simultaneously receive a confirmation via email. When it comes to managing clients' appointments through the app, we access the back end of the website where each user has different access based on their role. Providers usually log into their clinic, while case managers or other administrative roles can access the data of multiple clinics. Here, 
booking appear and they can be managed and edited as needed. Among the most used features in MENA Moves is the export feature to be able to track provider's time and analyze appointments data. The export can be done for all the data at once or disaggregated by clinic, month or provider, among other disaggregation types. Rhea also, uh, in addition to really helping our providers to use QuickRes, she was continually interacting with them to understand their experiences. Now we're going to hear from her on provider feedback. Now that you have seen how the system works, I'd also like to share the psychologist's reflections on QuickRes as it evolved. Here are four themes that were expressed most often. First, the psychologists valued how secure QuickRes felt to clients. This was true for three reasons. The first reason being that QuickRes did not force clients to share data that they did not feel comfortable giving. For example, real names, real birth dates, real gender, etc. The second reason was that being contacted via automated SMS was optional, which allowed clients to feel that they were in control of communications. Third, offering services entirely virtually meant it was possible for individuals to receive care with no one else knowing about it. These three components of the platform made the intervention work in highly stigmatizing and criminalized environments where those seeking mental health support could be taking on risks to do so. Across countries, the providers appreciated the flexibility of QuickRes for case management, where each one of them was able to use the app to the extent to which they felt comfortable with it and with technology in general. Another theme that was commonly brought up by psychologists is that they appreciated that QuickRes was continually adapted to their and their clients' needs. For example, they had influence over the features added to QuickRes during the intervention and to client-facing messages sent by ISMS. For the psychologists who are taking on such a significant responsibility to support those most marginalized, it was incredibly important that they felt the platform itself was an ally in their efforts. Finally, as you can see in the quote, QuickRes eased the transition to telehealth in locations where face-to-face -face is preferred. Okay, wonderful. And, and as Ben said, Rhea is on the line with us, so we will be able, you can ask her your questions directly. But I will finish up with a couple more slides on our results. Okay. So what you can see here is that incredibly small team has provided more than 3,000 sessions since it started in September. And you can also see uh, from the bar chart that a good portion of those have been remote. As Rhea said, in-person was preferred. That is the traditional way of offering mental health support. But as the project grew, and especially with waves of COVID, I can't remember all the waves, but in December there was quite a big one, that remote piece really was able to take on more of the client load. And interestingly, a piece that we learned that we weren't anticipating was that a lot of people alternate back and forth. So especially for young LGBT people, first they would do it virtually, right? They would have a WhatsApp call with this person, make sure that they felt safe, and then ultimately they may come and do face-to-face. -face. For a lot of other people, they wanted to establish a relationship first, and then they moved to remote because it was more convenient. The other pieces here, um, just anecdotally, we did not reach out. As Rhea said, one of the things really, really appreciated here was the secure nature of this. So we didn't do a lot of client outreach to hear directly from them. But what we heard from the providers and then occasionally from clients reaching out to CSOs was that this was really life-changing and life-saving. So we had folks who had attempted suicide in the past who were then able to stabilize. And then we had individuals who, for example, had tried repeatedly to pass end-of-year exams, but over issues such as anxiety could not ultimately achieve those goals. So I just want to end with uh, sharing some voices from those who are directly engaged. The first from a Tunisian psychologist. So today here in Tunisia, I think the program has connected us to people who otherwise cannot access mental health services, right? So that being a, a huge goal of ours, what we certainly wanted to achieve across these large countries. And then the second from a client in Tunisia who actually worked with this specific psychologist. At first, I was afraid. By the time I went to the provider, I felt safe, to be honest. Even the atmosphere was so safe. The environment was so safe. 
It was really, really good for me because I discovered more about myself. I developed many, many personal skills. I am more friends with myself. So I feel, again, I cannot give a clearer indication of how important these services were than you can see from these quotes here and just how much more accessible they became because of the project. So thank you so much, acknowledging the many people who were part of this, including the clients who were really willing to take a risk with us and looking forward to any questions. Thank you, Robin and Rhea, and we'll go to the next presentation, Carl Naimwaka. He's a regional site coordinator for the KP Star Project, uh, led by IntraHealth in Namibia. He is joined virtually, but we have a pre-recorded video where he'll be doing his presentation, but if you have questions, feel free to list them and he'll be on the call. We can start the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Carl Naimwaka. I'm a regional coordinator for the KP Star Project based in Ochoarongo. Oshodonjupa region, Namibia. The KP Star project is being implemented by Intra Health Namibia in partnership uh, with several local partners, which are the Wabes Bay Corridor Group and key population civil society organizations like Right Not Rescue Trust, Empower, the Health for All Movement, Voice of Hope Trust, the Society for Women Empowerment Trust, and Wings to Transcend Namibia Trust. Today, I plan to share with you about our approach to visual case management uh, to support clients' engagement in our ART and PrEP programs and uh, how we use uh, the app called QuickRes to facilitate this aspect of client engagement. QuickRes is the same online appointment booking software used in MENA as described by Ria and Robin earlier. But in Namibia, KP Star uses additional functions on QuickRest to support visual case management and cohort tracking for clients accessing ART and PrEP. In 2020, lockdown restrictions resulted in closure of some health facilities and hotspots, and this impacted routine delivery of HIV services to key populations. Quickrest is a multi-country web app for online appointment booking and case management developed by FHI 360, and it was launched in 2020. The KP Star project in Namibia deployed Quickrest to ensure access to important services, especially for persons enrolled on PrEP and ART. Quickrest is now deployed in 10 regions of Namibia with 44 case managers, use it as a tool to support their cohort of clients receiving case management for ART and PrEP. This is our model for virtual case management in Namibia. Uh, trained community-based case managers support clients to access services across a range of health facilities. One case manager supports the client through their clinical journey and have access to client information at various facilities. Their approach especially because clients do meet in person for some services. Let us have a quick demo of the QuickRest backend functions that are used by the case managers to support clients on PrEP and ART. Using QuickRest for virtual case management. In this video, we will review the QuickRest backend functions that are useful for virtual case management. Are you ready? Let's take the tour. Each case manager receives a user ID and password to access the backend portal. They may also be assigned a unique URL called a token that allows QuickRest to automatically add clients to a case manager's cohort. Once signed in, there is a simple intuitive interface with a simple navigation pane where a case manager may switch between a case manager's records and in some settings, clinic records. A longitudinal record is generated for each client, and case managers can use simple date filters to view past and upcoming appointments. They may also use ID labels to look up a client's record by their name or phone number. The cohort filters can also help a case manager to filter through their records of clients based on their service type and other categories. There are buttons on each client's record that allows case managers to record services received by the clients and note those services reported by clinic-based staff users. The case management section is mainly used by case managers 
to add a client to their cohort and to track when a client is due for refill and or a new service appointment. Case managers may also use QuickRes to report quarterly retention on drugs like ART and PrEP. With just one click, a case manager can book future appointments with the primary details about a client already replicated. There is a section for case notes and to track upcoming appointments. Case managers can also use QuickRes to screen for violence and report services for which a client has been referred. Uh, here is a quote from a client on ART who uses QuickRes. And I quote, QuickRes has made my life easier. I don't need to carry or check my health passport for my next appointment because QuickRes sends me a reminder. And the good thing is that I do not need to have a smartphone to receive these reminders. Any phone can receive the SMS. SMS. With QuickRes, I never miss my appointments at the clinic. Here is a brief snapshot of results from QuickRes. This graph shows uh, volume of appointments booked between January and December 2021. A total of 8,773 appointments were booked through QuickRes. And uh, note that multiple appointments can be booked for a single person for several services. A new appointment is made for a client, especially if service administered to them is not on the same day of their original appointment. 4,926 persons honored their appointments for PrEP and ART, and this includes refills, restart, and also initiation. 2,312 appointments were for ART and 2,614 appointments were for PrEP. At this point in time, QuickRes is only used by case managers under the KP Star program, but plans are underway to extend it to the Ministry of Health for a seamless case management, access to services and treatment retention. Therefore, QuickRes is not used for reporting results to national government at this moment. It is just a case manager facing tool that allows them to better understand the status of their clients in care, their history of service access, and also allows clients to book appointments on their own and receive reminders. I thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, we'll go to our next presentation from Purvi Shah. She's a regional consultant for innovative testing and virtual interventions with UNAIDS and WHO, and she's here in person. We'll pull up her presentation. Welcome, Purvi. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I actually wanted to start my presentation by saying that I'm so pleased and happy to be here um, because, you know, virtual interventions have come a long way and I've seen it grow. And uh, I'm, it's really close to my heart as well. So it, it's, it's really, I'm really happy and proud to be, to be presenting here today. Um, I was also very impressed by the great work that was presented by all the previous presenters because you know we 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 finally are seeing a lot of data coming out of virtual interventions and we see the kind of impact that it's having on our programs now. Um, before I start the presentation with regards policy and advocacy, I um, you know wanted to um, you know say that this is going to be the next big thing uh, as far as HIV programs are concerned and. Um, you know, my presentation will will take you through some of the some of the important um, policy and advocacy related um, things that UNAIDS and WHO has thought about. Can we have the slides up, please? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start with saying that you know, back in 2017-18, uh, when we had started thinking of virtual interventions. Uh, it was very different, you know. We just knew that there were a lot of people that were accessing social media platforms and dating apps, and uh, you know, people had st people had stopped actually visiting physical hotspots, and were actually on virtual hotspots. Uh, so it was a little different that you know from what we've been seeing in the in the last few decades of the HIV program, but we definitely realized that that's the way we need to go. 
We also saw that programs were looking for virtual channels to actually reach the unreached populations on these social media platforms and dating apps. And while implementing some of the programs that I've, I've also done in the past, we understood that um, virtual interventions definitely would give you a large reach, but it would often, uh, you know, uh, be misunderstood as being replacement for the physical uh, outreach that is being done. But in no manner uh, does it replace it. We just want to supplement what's already existing in order to bridge the gaps and if we want to reach the targets uh, that have been set for us. Um, fast forward to 2020, 2021, we know that, you know, COVID came upon and uh, programs were struggling with regards to how do we continue providing services to populations um, without having to actually call them to a facility or a service center. And, uh, you know, that's when uh, UNAIDS and WHO actually took, uh, took this as an opportunity to develop some guidance uh, for countries and programs that were, in, that were interested in initiating or implementing virtual interventions. Uh, the first step that we did, um, you know, for developing a guidance, you know, there is a process that we, that we would usually follow. Um, and because there was not a lot of research that was available online, uh, we decided to do a landscaping exercise in the Asia and the Pacific to see what kind of virtual interventions existed in these countries and what were some of the gaps, um, you know, where, where guidance could, could actually help these countries to implement it better. So this is just a quick snapshot. I'm not going to go into much detail, but just a snapshot of the kind of information that we collected through this landscape. And we learned a lot about uh, what was going on in these countries and, and what was the kind of internet coverage that was available, uh, what were the kind of populations that were covered under virtual interventions, what were the gaps. Um, and it also helped us basically to understand that uh, there's a lot that needs to be done still. There were a lot of programs and countries that were implementing virtual interventions, but there wasn't necessarily a structure to it, uh, and they were pretty ad hoc. We also uh, did this exercise in 13 countries, and we uh, kind of understood and learned uh, through this process by talking to various key informant, uh, uh, through key informant consultations. And, you know, we came up with these high-level recommendations which said that it is important that we have a standard um, and structured guidance for the use of virtual interventions, um, mainly for reaching out to the non-identifying populations. Non-identifying populations, I mean uh, people who don't necessarily identify themselves as key populations, but are vulnerable and in need of services. This guidance needs to be used as a reference, um, and it is completely flexible. It can be adapted to various contexts and populations based on the needs and requirements of the country. It, is also, it was also uh, recommended that, you know, virtual interventions must be used to provide services across the cascade and not just for prevention and testing, as we had seen in many countries where they would only do virtual interventions for, for just awareness or maybe testing, but then not link them across the cascade. Virtual interventions also uh, should be used for all priority populations and not just for MSM populations. Uh, security and confidentiality of clients and all kinds of data needs to be taken care of. This is a responsibility of the implementer to make sure that there are security guidelines and policies in place. Um, and we also thought that it is important to find sustainable resources uh, to be able to institutionalize these, these interventions. And so we decided to develop a policy brief on virtual interventions uh, in response to HIV, hepatitis, hepatitis and STI programs. Um, we also came up with a priority uh, population and segmentation uh, you know, methodology, which would actually help countries to prioritize what populations they wanted to reach and reach with services on virtual channels. Safety and security, like I mentioned, is, is, is a very important part of the virtual interventions, and WHO and UNAIDS both um, think that there needs to be some kind of a structured guidance on how data is going to be protected, um, how are we going to actually ensure that, that all the data and the confidentiality of the clients that we are reaching online is maintained uh, and is protected. 
coming to the advocacy role of that UNAIDS and WHO uh, will be playing in the future, uh, mainly we've been thinking in terms of integrating virtual interventions into national programs. Um, and, uh, you know, UNAIDS and WHO, I think, are going to take some steps in terms of providing technical assistance to countries and national programs to understand what virtual interventions are uh, and then help them integrate into the national programs as well. It is also important that um, you know, national programs, stakeholders, and community is on board when we are planning or uh, you know, doing any kind of implementation on virtual interventions. And I think that kind of advocacy, if, if it comes from the community, I think it's, it would have the best impact. And uh, TA support from countries um, you know, that have virtual interventions already existing in the Global Fund grants is something that we are going to look at. And we would be very happy to provide any support uh, to countries or programs that, that are in interested in initiating or implementing virtual interventions. Um, last but not the least, I'm excited to say that we are launching the policy brief on virtual interventions tomorrow at the conference at, uh, in room 519B. Uh, so if anybody is interested and available, please do drop in and uh, we'd be very happy to have you there. Thank you very much. I wanted to acknowledge uh, the contribution of my team members from UNAIDS and WHO um, and thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Well, welcome everyone to the moderated discussion. I'm going to hand over right now to Dr. Van Gwen um, to moderate this discussion, including any questions from you uh, and also from online. Uh, Dr. Van is, um, is a technical officer for HIV, viral hepatitis, and STI at the WHO country office in Vietnam. Van? Thank you, Ben. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you guys can get some food before you came here, and then you can <laughs> stay with us a little bit more longer. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, our excellent speaker, um, some people uh, here with us, but also some speaker actually joined virtually. Uh, my name is Dr. Wen uh, from uh, WHO country office in Vietnam, as uh, Ben already introduced. Um, uh, so. Um, before we start our discussion and also uh, question and answer, let me also share with you uh, our experiences in Vietnam in terms of telehealth. Uh, as you may know, WHO uh, actually recommended HIV cell testing in 2016. And in 2017, um, MOH uh, Vietnam also piloted HIV cell testing. And then from the success of the pilots, um, Vietnam also scaled up HIV cell testing in 2018 after um, HIV cell testing actually recommended in the national guidelines. Also, we see our key population and partner very well accepted HIV cell testing. We also see HIV testing actually uh, increase over time through HIV cell testing, but also from facility-based and community-based testing. But still, we found that a proportion of our population couldn't reach to the HIV testing services. For many reasons, they might not still hesitate to go to the facility-based or community-based to pick up the HIV cell test. Or they don't have time, or even if the, the distance is far, they still not very convenient for them to pick up the HIV cell testing. So from that point, um, WHO um, working with MOH to develop a website. So from the website, our com community can register for cell testing. And they also can request for the commodity uh, prevention, such as condom, lubricants, or needle syringe, whatever they need. So they need to go to the website. That's to create an account like a Gmail account or Facebook account, and from their accounts, they can request for HIV cell testing. So we initially pilot in on provinces and uh, in November 2020. So when we designed the website, the COVID-19 has not come yet, but when we pilot it actually during the COVID pandemic, and this innovative approach become more relevant because people don't need to go physically to pick up the test, especially during the travel uh, restriction. So we started with one provinces, and then we expanded another two provinces, 
after four months. We see that it worked very well. And uh, now, uh, MO with Vietnam already expanded, scale up in 22 provinces. And we see the uptake of the HIV cell testing through website is substantially increased from 350 tests per month. Now it's a nearly 1,000 tests per month. And especially we can read the young key populations, about 50% of those who pick up the test through the website are 15 to 24 years old. We also found that nearly 50% of them never test before, which means that we read unrisk key population. People also ask, how about after the testing? We also have that question. We also worry that people get tested, but they don't share the result with us. But actually, 70% people sharing the result. And then we can support them. We hear health staff and peer educator support them to link to ARV and also PrEP. So about 95% linked to HIV confirmatory tests and 96% linked to ARV, which is a really easy success. Also 21% linked to PrEP for those people who have negative results. So from our lesson learned, we also support the um, uh, new approach that we are discussing today about telehealth, especially during COVID-19. We are not only creating demand through Facebook, like Nepal already did. We can provide uh, mental counseling at uh, also our college um, uh, that's presented. We can also monitor our patient, ART patient, PrEP patient from quick rest. So we have a lot of uh, lesson learned and experience today here, and I really hope that um, we can have, you know, sharing our um, momentum, but also very good lesson learned to you in any country that you consider to, to implement or to apply any telehealth or virtual intervention in the country for to, to serve our population. Now, it's time for us to ask the questions, and uh, I would like to prioritize our virtual audiences. Uh, they already send us the questions, and then if you, any one of you sitting here, if you have any questions, we go, please go ahead to the micro, and we can ask our panel to, to respond to the question. So from our virtual uh, audiences, we have uh, three questions. Um, the first question I would like to go to um, Aguinif, uh, Raphael, sorry if I pronounce your name uh, not correctly. The question is, how can the social media be used to reduce stigma in remote setting where the grip on culture is strong? Any of our panelists would like to respond to this question? Yes, Jamie, can you please respond to this question? Thank you. Jamie, were you able to hear the question? You know what, can you repeat it, please? Sure. How can the social media be used to reduce stigma in remote setting where the grip on culture is strong? Yeah. So, you know, my perspective is we need to model behavior, right? And so if you find somebody within your community, from your church, from your town, from your school, from wherever, that's bringing new ideas to the table and talking openly about how they, you know, are destigmatizing HIV and AIDS and how they are, um, you know, approaching it in a way that you've never experienced before. That's the first step. Right. And it's all about bringing it back to home. I think a lot of us, um, you know, have times in our lives where we've been exposed to new ideas, but those exposures really take root when it comes from somebody who we trust. And the whole idea of that trust ecosystem we presented is that you want to hear more voices that come from closer to home. And that's where you start to shift the needle on any sort of stigmatism. Um, and, and I think that that conversation on social media is such a brilliant place to have it because you can express yourself so creatively and with humor and with honesty and, and in so many relatable ways, but also that kind of many sizes fits all approach where, um, you know, each of us can express ourselves differently, but you're actually repeatedly exposed to that new perspective. And so I think social media is a brilliant channel for um, bringing ideas from around the world together, both from, from your own community, as well as you know, that exposure that might have felt far away before. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, 
I hope that uh, can answer to the question, um, Equinify, uh, Rafael. Uh, our next question from um, Ten Lilia. Lilia Ten from Life uh, for Me Plus. What procedure were used in order to protect personal data? I think that's a really good question. When we go online, people may think that, you know, they expose their personal information to the whole world. So can you drop in, please? Yeah, you know, I think one of the really important things for us um, dealing with the groups that we really wanted to take advantage of this service was to make sure that they felt really clear on how their data would be stored and used and that they also felt really in the driver's seat about how much data they provided. So as Rhea said, we did a lot to make sure that people did not have to provide real names, they did not have to provide real birth dates, real genders, and instead they were able to have that conversation with the psychologist. And actually what we heard again and again from the psychologist was, you know, after a few sessions, the person would say, I want to let you know I lied about my address. I want to let you know I didn't tell you my real name and it's this, right? So our strategy was both clarity, you know, we have a really strong terms of reference or user terms where people could understand, you know, we do have real phone numbers. What would you like us to do if you no longer want us to have your real phone number? Here's who to contact. But then the most important piece, and I think again, just thinking back to that quote of like, this environment was so safe for me, was not forcing that data to begin with. And, and I do think, especially in this context where telehealth is new and it's not always um, clearly defined in local policy, having less data felt a lot safer to us as well. Thank you, Robin. Similar to what we did in the, in the website, so people also think that, oh, my put, I put my information in the website so other people can see it. But again, we, we don't ask them to put the real name. They can put the, you know, whatever name they want. They don't need to have like a date, month, and year of birth. They can just tell how old they are. And, but once they have the result, they want to go to enroll into the services, they need to show you know, their own name, their, uh, because that, um, you know, the policy is that they, they should have uh, the real name when they enroll for ART, for example. But we do need a phone number, because a phone number, we can contact them. Without the fixed phone numbers, and we lost the client. So I think that could also contribute to, the, to keeping the personal information confidentiality. Now, we have another question from um, Mali Dennis. Yes. Can I keep this question? OK. Uh, how can we adapt the virtual case management tool um, to safely report and link ex uh, cases of violence among uh, key population? So is that from um, Ben, you want to respond? Sure. So the question is how to use quick res mm -hmm. to report and link clients to post-violence services. Carl's also on the call, and he's been using QuickRes for virtual case management for clients on ART and PrEP, and post-violence services are an essential component of, of, of that area of the cascade. So Carl, if you have any particular points you want to mention, I'm not sure if your program is systematically using QuickRes to report on violence services, but I'll just say that clients, as they book for other services, the option of also including a violence screening is there during your appointment if it's offered by that provider and and that can be done in the session and on the back end it can be reported that I did the screening, these types of violence were reported or were not reported and then it opens up the option to say I provided these certain services in my facility, I provided these four other services as a referral to another facility and for each of those other uh, referral uh, services, the, the provider can note which facility they referred that client to. So they can go back to the system and say, where did I refer this client for these services? They can check and maybe call the client, hey, were you able to go to this facility? It's a bit of a reporting, not well, reporting, but it keeps track of what you support the client to receive so you can follow up on those services. Carl, is there anything else that you'd like to mention about the use of QuickRes for uh, post-violence services? I uh, think you were spot on, Ben. Um, it's just to say we are also actually in the process of upscaling um, the uh, intimate partner violence issue 
And uh, we are currently also doing, um, or we have actually uh, mapped the services in every uh, priority geographic area to where uh, the clients can be referred for post-violence uh, incidents. Yeah, thank you. And really sorry for keeping waiting. Can you, we go for lady first? Yes, please. Hi everyone, Rebecca Hope at Ylabs. Thank you for a really inspiring set of presentations today. Lots of really innovative ideas. Um, my question is around um, that measurement from engagement to conversion and uptake of services. I think you made a really great point, Pravi, in your session around you can get really rapid and large reach with these kind of social media campaigns, but then you have this cascade of drop off when you're actually getting to, to services. And we've seen that in our work, especially, I think, especially when we're on taboo or stigmatized topics and populations where people don't want their data tracked, they don't want to sign on, they don't want to log in. So I'm curious if you guys on the uh, virtual panel and, and also in person, if you could share any examples of kind of promising approaches to, to measuring that kind of conversion um, to service uptake and ultimately impact on health outcomes so we can kind of strengthen the case for digital health innovation. Thank you. Ben, please. Um, this would have been a great question for Anuradha because she's actually was presenting on Facebook and using those channels to be able to create demand, but also link people to services. And this never was really presented in my introductory remarks, but the Nepal program, uh, Namibia, and also the MENA project all use a platform we call Aura, Online Reservation and Case Management App. And in some countries, they, they call it something different. It's branded for the local uh, program. Otherwise, they might share QuickRes, which is a global multi-country platform. And what's useful about this tool, it was actually first designed to be able to link people from online demand creation to offline service uptake. Essentially, it allows us to create unique links for each online ad or promotion or influencer or peer that they can use to promote their followers or people who see the ad to click and go to that website. It's not an app, you don't need to download it. And then they can book their appointment on that link. It doesn't track to the individual, just to the campaign or the outreach method. But when you go onto Aura or QuickRes, you'll be able to log in and do a data analysis by each of those campaign links. So you can see your effectiveness from each of the different marketing channels, and you can know how to optimize some of those approaches. What we found originally is when we use some of the bigger influencers or Facebook advertising, we did get a large reach, a lot of people. But then the percent of those who we reached to booking, to arriving, was a very steep uh, decline. And the challenge was then, how do we build in more interpersonal connections in the outreach and also link people from maybe those more impersonal, broader marketing approaches to more of a personal connection? So sometimes instead of linking directly from an influencer to booking, we say, hey, talk to my friend Ben. He's a peer educator. He can help you understand your service needs and help you book that appointment. When we started using this surround sound approach, which had a component that was more peer-to-peer -peer or, or, uh, or person-to-person, one-to-one, we saw the conversion rates increase uh, quite dramatically. So I think globally, uh, with programs using QuickRes, we see a conversion rate from booking to arrival um, around 65%, which is pretty good for when you're online, you say you're gonna sign up for a campaign or you're going to attend some event or attend a webinar or <laughs> conference to actually attending uh, can be quite low. So it shows that having that personal connection and support really does help with those outcomes. Thank you, Ben. Can we go with the next question? Hi. Please. So <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my name is Rajat. So I have a, a one quick comment and maybe one question for all the panelists. So the comment is, I think one of the very few, you know, positive impact of COVID-19 is being virtual. And uh, so I'm from WHO India country office. Uh, Purubi probably knows that Everates and WHO, we supported uh, one uh, CBO called Ashodaya in Mysore, uh, in Karnataka, who actually did telehealth during this pandemic time uh, among key population groups, sex workers, uh, uh, MSMTG, and they documented that, and I think they are going to disseminate very soon. So the 
excellent presentation and I think I completely agree with Purvi that this is the next big thing. So the question which I have that, you know, the title of the session is telehealth. But we have seen, we were mostly talking about online, Facebook, etc. So my fundamental question is, how is it, why didn't call it eye health or e-health? We have called telehealth. So I know the Oshoda project was purely telehealth. It was consultation through telephone. So how is it different from, you know, eye health, e-health? How do we distinguish? That's all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, terms, uh, am I right? Um, I would say it's a good question. So we've been focusing on telehealth, but with a broader definition of how to deliver health education, information, and services using remote technologies or remote channels. So it, for most of our work and the presentations today, it was about the client to provider interface or client to HIV program interface, and how do you make that and the services you should deliver to those clients be done using a remote channel? Um, there, are, there are broader areas of M health, um, digital development, digital health. Those engage in t sometimes in broader areas that we're not focusing on here, which could be um, like health tracker apps, um, which are for you as a person, but not to a provider or not to a health program. Or you have other channels like digital client uh, trackers that the clients do not engage with, but the health program does. So those M Health, or sorry, HMIS systems, if they don't engage with the client, they're not part of what we were framing as telehealth. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we did say tele, like telephone and health, and it does make us think that it's a phone call. Um, that's just one very easy channel, but it's all those apps are ways you can connect with a person through a phone, a smartphone, and of course it can also extend to a computer, Skype call, WhatsApp call. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps frame it a little bit more. Sorry, I don't know where the speaker was, uh, but in the back. I'm, I hope I've been able to address that question. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have two questions from here. Can I invite you, please? Oh, yeah. sure. Thank you. Hi, thank you for a wonderful panel, both in person and online. Carrie Johnson from Boston. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit, and this is for any of the panelists who choose to respond, what is the role of the beneficiaries or the target communities in the actual design and implementation evaluation of all of this? Meaning, I, this has been really great. I know I see your nods. I know you get this and you've done this. But it basically, as you know, from an advocacy perspective, it's great to talk about all these programs, get them rolled out, reach all these people, but what do they have to say? And when do they say it? And then what happens when something goes wrong? Yes. Thank you for that question. I think it's a very relevant question, and I, I did address it partly in my presentation that, you know, community members and beneficiaries are the most important aspect of why we design or develop a program. So the first thing that, that we usually, uh, you know, do is, is plan the program. And as part of the planning, we do involve the community as, as an advisory group or do community consultations to understand, first of all, the needs and preferences of the community or the population that we want to try and reach uh, with the services. Uh, so try and understand what their needs are, um, and then design the program based on those needs and preferences. Uh, so they are involved right from the beginning uh, in, in terms of, not just in terms of you know, what they want, but also how should it be delivered? What is their preference of seeking that delivery as well? So whether it's home-based services or they would like to go to a facility, they want it to be more anonymous, uh, you know, and we take all those inputs and then start designing the program. So that's the kind of um, planning process that we have from the beginning. So community advocacy actually plays a very important role as part of any program, not just virtual interventions. So it, they are, they're absolutely a part and a very important part of the program. Thank you, Pupi. Uh, okay, sure, sure. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So, I, Rhea, I'm hoping um, you would be willing to add to this, but I think one of the great things about the Mina Moves project was continual interaction with beneficiaries via the CSOs that initially linked them to services. 
And um, Rhea, what would be wonderful if, if you don't mind speaking to kind of how we ultimately changed how service providers offered their services, um, the traveling, et cetera, so that they could be more accessible in response to some of that client feedback. I think it's just such a good question. Thank you, Robin. Um, can I invite it to you? Oh, Ryan? Okay. Hi. <laughs> thanks, Robin. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here, even if it's virtually. Um, I think, yeah, um, this question is super interesting, and, and it's really, like, I was smiling and nodding <laughs> when when it was being asked, because, because we really, like, it was really, beneficiaries' input was really very important in the way we were designing and even updating the, the the platform because we could also like it's a very flexible platform that we were able to readapt to the needs of the beneficiaries specifically and we were not talking to beneficiaries directly right because of like we wanted them to be to feel safe we didn't like we wanted we wanted them to talk to us through the providers but also through the cso's the local cso's who we were working with so all the feedback and all the comments and all really even when they were voicing their concerns we were able to translate all of these into updates and upgrades to the platforms to be able to answer really their needs and ensure that they were really like they felt safe using the platform and i think this is really one of the key of the successes of uh, of the the project because it was really like this is this is really what we were based on this is really what we were we were this is what we wanted to know and this is what we were getting all along and this is what we told the providers that it was first thing we told them that this is a pilot project and we want your feedback and we want to know how beneficiaries are feeling and we want to know if they're liking the process if, if there's anything that we can change to make their experience better so yeah i think uh, their input was our fuel for for making everything better thanks Thank you, Ria. Can I invite you for the question? Thank you so much. Um, um, my name is Panatana Nakhon from the uh, USA, the Regional Development Mission for Asia. My question goes to the, um, the mental health um, program as well. I, I, I believe that it's, uh, right now it's mental health is quite critical and uh, all the, even for the key populations need to get the, this kind of service. My, my uh, question is that if you look at in the demand for access on this kind of services, quite increasing uh, significantly. And if we rely on only professional uh, psychologists, it might not be able to provide at scale. Uh, my question is, would it be possible that we bring the communities, uh, the lay provider has been trained, I mean, will be trained, but the train is might be uh, to receive the certification at the national program rather than just to one organization. That is might be a part of the uh, integrated the the services at the national program. So, uh, what do you think about to bring the lay uh, lay people to uh, start to provide the mental health, and also mental health might be a part of entry point for the other HIV services. It's not only the alone uh, activity. Would it be maybe to see the linkage between the mental health and others, uh, the services that they might be able to access, or even to retain them for the other uh, services? Thank you so much. So thank you. Thank very you. good I'll question, be, Robin. I'll be okay. very brief. Okay. I know we're almost done, but I feel like we met before this, and I ask you to ask that question because it's exactly what we're thinking about. So very much so, psychologists are not always available. There are sustainability issues. But I think what, what we really see this platform is capable of achieving is providing supportive supervision to lay health providers. So we strongly believe in a, a peer-focused approach. That's the approach we take to our HIV programs. But if we're gonna ask people to take on yet another responsibility, and especially one that could carry some risk of vicarious trauma, we really want that to be done with supportive supervision. So this same platform is currently supporting implementers as they do their work. And we have heard from a lot of frontline workers who say, I just wanna talk to someone about my own clients, right? Like I need to talk about how this experience has been. I think there are huge opportunities here to make mental health more accessible in an ethical way by having that, that supportive supervision. And just to your, your second point around how much more desirable services become when mental health is offered. In other countries, um, when we began offering mental health services, 
in addition to general violence response, we saw sometimes five, 10, 15 times as many people come forward and be willing to talk to us about the issues they faced because that's the part of the service they want, right? They don't just want PEP, they don't just want an HIV test, they need to talk to somebody to whom they can unburden themselves. So 100%, I think there are huge opportunities here and I'm, I'm really excited to see how telehealth can play a role in making this more accessible for all. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, yes, please, your question. I don't know if I should take off my mask or just talk through it. As a, hi there, I'm Joe Canelli um, from Toronto with a Kiwi accent, New Zealand accent. Um, so what, what is the role of, of evidence-based science and clinical trials in the deployment of, you know, of telehealth and technology? Like during the pandemic, we saw, um, you know, the telecommunications companies and Shopify and all these other people that actually had no skills in treating patients come forward, lobby governments, get money, roll out COVID contact tracing systems that, you know, fell flat. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, you wouldn't, just because a computer scientist can develop a, you know, surgical robot, you don't give them the keys to the operating room. And, and we've kind of done that in telehealth. We've, we've, you know, I'm advisor with a company that's, you know, that's in the virtual health space. They've done seven clinical trials. They started in 2008, so way back when, you know, published in The Lancet in 2010. And, and it really is a medical intervention that they're involved in, but we don't treat it like a medical intervention. So that's my question there. Thank you very much. Anyone? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, well, we're almost uh, out of. We are out of time. Hopefully, a couple more minutes. I think maybe you might be one of the experts on the panel that could help address us that question. But um, but what, we, what we've seen in our programs is that for the last, I'd say, twenty years, there have been virtual interventions. Um, they've always been done on the side of programs. It hasn't been until very recently, such as in Vietnam, very well integrated in an overall approach. And quite rarely, it's been integrated at the national level, but maybe more in the higher middle income countries, yes. Uh, in our programs, which are mainly in the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia, for FHI 360, focusing on implementation science, so implementing with mechanisms to monitor both results as relates to health services, but also client feedback and adverse events or complaints, and at least using that to be able to demonstrate effectiveness for scale up or for adaptations to other countries. Um, and in some cases, also giving a more granular look at the data and doing additional data collection, interviews, et cetera, with clients. I mean, I think the first step is people now are implementing at a little larger scale. It's not just the nerds in the, in, in, in the back room doing these things on their own anymore. Um, that you can invest, or programs can invest a little bit more on the evaluation or the research components. And there's been a lot of articles uh, since COVID actually on on how things have changed to virtual in the last just two years. So there, there has been quite a bit. I don't know, Van, if, uh, Dr. Van, if you have additional comments on, on that question. Yeah, I think that's okay. Um, we are reminded because uh, our time is over. And uh, before we conclude this session, I really uh, would like to thank all our speakers and panelists, especially those in the riot uh, virtually. And uh, I would like to thank all the audiences for the um, um, participation, contribution, comment, and question. And we really apologize for the question from virtual audiences that we don't have time to respond to all the question, but uh, for the audiences here, please come up with it if you still have any question. And once again, thank you so much. <laughs>